Welcome to our series, Chasing the Wind, a survey of the Old Testament book of Ecclesiastes, where we'll learn some important life lessons from someone who had the resources to chase after everything this world has to offer. We hope you'll discover through this series what the author ultimately discovered. It's more rewarding to pursue the maker of the wind than chase after it. Let's now join Pastor Alan Brooks of New Life Church in Rio Rancho, New Mexico, as he leads us in our study. But let me set the stage for where we're going. I heard a cute story this week about a woman talking about her mom. And her mom got on a bus, you know, city transportation. And when she got on, all the seats were pretty much taken. And people were standing in the aisle. You've all been in a situation like that, right? A crowded public transportation. And so she's looking for something to hang on to. You know, people are hanging on to the shelves and the straps. And and so she decides to hang on to a pole that a guy's holding on to. And as soon as she does, the guy kind of gives her a look. And some of you may have had that happen even. He doesn't say anything, but he just gives her the look. And and inside, she says her mom thought, well, how rude, you know. Doesn't he want to share the pole with me? And uh, anyway... A few stops down, he, the man finally spoke to the woman and said, uh, so this is my stop. And she looked around, and she wasn't blocking the exit, and she says, okay, so what? And he says, I need to take my pole with me. This is the curtain rod I bought at the hardware store. <laughs> now, that might qualify as what we call a senior moment, right? <laughs> You'll see where I'm going with that here in a moment. Uh, Some of you know that there was a pretty famous person, a great person, who died recently. (laughs) Did you say St. Patrick? (laughs) Yeah, he he died, that's right, but that was quite a while ago. (laughs) Well, the great person that I'm talking about is actually her second guest, Stephen Hawking. Some of you might have been thinking I was thinking of someone else. Uh, He died just this past Wednesday, actually. Here's something that he said, which I thought was provocative. He says, I regard the brain as a computer, which will stop working when its components fail. Thus, he told the Guardian. He says, there is no heaven or afterlife for broken down computers. Notice this statement. That's a fairy story for people afraid of the dark. Now, it's not really a surprising statement coming from a staunch atheist. But not unlike the woman on the bus, might I suggest that when Hawkins came to his stop, he was probably, like her, a little bit surprised with what was there awaiting him. Would you agree? Hawkins, I indicated, was a great man. And let me explain why I say that. Many believe he was the most brilliant scientist since Einstein, and made major contributions, obviously, to the academic and scientific community. And for that, I would say he was unquestionably a great man. Secondarily, he was a man who had great struggles, as even his picture demonstrates. In his picture, you see that he has a condition that some of you have maybe had friends or family suffering with, and that's ALS. I didn't know until this week that he was diagnosed when he was 21. And he was told, like most others who get ALS, that they've got two to three years to live. In fact, I had a good friend who died from ALS, and true to form, he died within about two to three years after he was diagnosed. But Hawkins lived an extraordinarily long period of time. I'm trying to remember, but he was in his 70s, as I recalled. What was that? 74. He was asked about his difficulties, and here's what he said. He said, remember to look up at the stars and not down at your feet. Try to make sense of what you see and wonder about what makes the universe exist. Be curious. And however difficult life may seem, there is always something you can do and succeed at. As I was reflecting upon his passing, I also thought about the study we've been in in the book of Solomon, I believe written by Solomon, the book of Ecclesiastes. And we see two very wise men, learned men. Men, I would say, in both cases were very curious about life, as Solomon put it, life under the sun. 
right? And long before there was a formal scientific method, if you think about it, Solomon put together this idea of going and searching actively, true to even what Hawkins was suggesting. And as you look at this, you'll realize that he did do some research and observation. We saw that back in chapter 1 when we started this study 11 weeks ago. He said, I devoted myself to search for understanding and to explore by wisdom everything being done under heaven. He made a hypothesis, Solomon did, as you might recall. All of man's activities under the sun are vanity or meaningless, depending on what way you want to translate that. He said it's like chasing the wind. And he made a prediction of sorts, I would say. We see that in verse 18 of chapter 1. He says, much learning earns you much trouble. The more you know, the more you hurt. And I would suggest that's true oftentimes for great men like Stephen Hawking. They gain so much information and so much knowledge that sometimes that blocks out the simpler things, the simpler understandings of life. I've often been struck by how much harder it is for somebody of great intelligence to have faith and how incredibly easy it seems it is for people that have lesser education and intelligence. But he did his experimentations with the four P's, as I like to call them. He experimented with pleasure. He experimented with great possessions, great power, and great position. He had all of those things in an abundance. And what we do today is we look at his final conclusion, as it were, in chapters 11 and 12. If you haven't done so, we ask you to open your app and turn there or open your actual paper Bible, and let's jump in here. We're going to look as we have already at verses a few at a time and talk about them. Verse 1, chapter 11. Cast your bread upon the waters, for you will find it after many days. Give a portion to seven or even to eight, for you know not what disaster may happen on earth. If the clouds are full of rain, they empty themselves on the earth. And if a tree falls to the south or to the north, in the place where the tree falls, there it will lie. As Matt, I think it was, shared in our teaching team this week, he says that's almost like stating the obvious, right? Where the tree falls, there it shall lie. Oh, go figure, right? But there's a lot more in this in what he's talking about. In fact, the first phrase, cast your bread upon the waters, was a cultural idiom. And if you look at the meaning of the words, the word bread is not unlike a slang word in the 60s. You know, when people in the 60s would talk about bread, they were talking about what? They were talking about resources. They were talking about money. Casting upon the water was the idea of venturing out, take some risk. And even to this idea, which is, I think, easier for us to understand, that you're going to find after many days. But in other words, it may take time, and it may take a lot of patience but ultimately, you'll probably see some kind of return. Now, the interpretation of these verses are debated, and I'm going to share what I believe is probably the more um, obvious from the other verses' meaning, but it could be interpreted differently. But it's the idea of commerce, the idea that a merchant would venture out and even ship some of their goods through multiple shippers, realizing that it might take some time before they would actually recognize any reward on that. But within it, he's saying that they need to diversify. Don't use the same ship or use multiple shippers. Use various means. We have a phrase, an idiom in our culture that says, don't put all your eggs in one basket. It's, it's kind of that same idea. He points out here, and this is what leads me to believe this is more the meaning of this set of verses. He says, you never know what will happen, what disaster will come upon you. Because from a commerce standpoint, ships could be wrecked by storms, right? And the goods that they're traveling with could be lost at sea. Trees could fall and block the road, the destination that a shipper was taking to get to another city. And just so you know, the GPSs of that day did not have that rerouting feature like ours do. Okay, It wasn't quite so easy sometimes for them to go around and to find another way to get to that place. In verse 4, he goes on and he says, He who observes the wind will not sow. 
He who regards the clouds will not reap. As you do not know the way the spirit comes to the bones in the womb of a woman with child, so you do not know the work of God who makes everything. In the morning sow your seed, and at evening withhold not your hand, for you do not know which will prosper, this or that, or whether both alike will be good. Part of what I think he's trying to say here is do what you can. A person who's too concerned about what the wind's going to do, what the clouds are going to do, it causes them often to do what? Nothing. There's a term in the business world that we used to use, and it's called paralysis by analysis. We overthink things, and because we're thinking so much about what if, what if, what if, we don't do anything at all. And part of what Solomon's trying to say here is do something, do whatever you can do. Get up in the morning and plant. Do it again in the evening. But leave the result in God's hands. For all you know, maybe both of what you planted in the morning and the evening will come up. But just wait and see what God is going to do. Do what you can. Then he goes on in verse 7 and he says that light is sweet. And it's pleasant for the eyes to see the sun. So if a person lives many years, let him rejoice in them all, but let him remember that the days of darkness will be many. All that comes is vanity. Live in the light. He says that light is sweet. It's pleasant to see the sun. I think you could reword that to say, don't be a cave dweller. Get out and enjoy the the sunshine. I was in the gym the other day, this was just last uh, Thursday, I believe it was, and got in a conversation with a woman, and, and one of the things that she said at a certain point, she said, praise Jesus. And I asked her, I said, you know, is that uh, just simply a phrase that you say, or is it a phrase of adoration? And she said, it was absolutely, it's a phrase of adoration. And you know what she was talking about? She had just moved here from Washington State. <laughs> and she was like, praise Jesus for the sun, Right? <laughs> But Solomon here is using metaphors to make a contrast. Throughout the Hebrew Scriptures, light is understood in a lot of ways to be life. It's sweet. And what Solomon is saying is if you get a lot of years, work, and I would say that it requires this, work to enjoy them all. But then he's contrasting it with darkness. Darkness would be a metaphor for what? For death. Light is life. Darkness is death. Notice what he says about the days of darkness or the days of death. They are what? They're many. We have a phrase that some of you have heard. Life is short, but death is forever. Right? I find it ironic that Hawking said that the afterlife was a fairy story for people that are afraid of the dark. And albeit true, I think there is great darkness for some in death, I think there is greater light than any of us have ever experienced for others in the afterlife. Decided to use this next couple of verses out of the New Living because I think they're just so rich there. In verse 9 it says, Young people, it's wonderful to be young. Enjoy every minute of it. Do everything you want to do. Take it all in. You know, it is great to be full of excitement and full of energy. It feels like just yesterday that I felt like that. (laughs) Some 30 years ago, right? But part of what he's trying to say is do the things you want to do. Go experience the world. See the world. But note his important disclaimer here in that. But remember that you must give an account to God for everything you do. So refuse to worry. Keep your body healthy. But remember that youth with a whole life before you is meaningless. It seems like he's headed in such a good direction, and he comes right back to the meaningless part, right? You know, we tend to see some of this with New Testament eyes. 
Solomon and the people of his era saw that God's blessing or God's judgment would come to them in this life. They weren't thinking about a life beyond. They were looking at this life to be the place that they would see God's blessing or God's judgment. And part of what he's trying to encourage the young especially, but all of us, I would say, is to refuse to worry. Keep yourself healthy and fit. Wow. Just think how much better life generally would be for all people, but even maybe for you, if you did this very thing. You refuse to worry. I love that word, refuse. You get tempted, you want to worry, you want to be concerned about something, and you just refuse it. No, I don't accept that. I'm not going to worry. What if we protected ourselves more emotionally that way? Do you think life would be a little richer for some of us? I think it would be. Not only that, for some of us, we do need to be mindful of taking care of ourselves physically. That's one of the reasons that I make a regular practice of going and working out a couple of days a week at the gym and work out a couple of days at home beyond that. But the idea is that I'm trying to do the best job I can to take care of both my physical as well as my emotional body. I like that he repeats this little phrase, but remember twice. I don't know if you caught that. But his second time, he makes the point that the days of youth will come quickly to an end. And some of us could say a hearty what to that? Amen. It it seems to go just like that. I mean, it seems like just the other day I was in my 20s and doing just pretty much anything that I wanted to do. And now I'm an old guy. What do I do with that? You know? In chapter 12, he starts off and says, Remember also your Creator in the days of your youth. For those of you that like a little deeper deeper cut on the Scriptures, I want to point your attention to something here. In verse 9, Solomon says, Remember that you have to give an account to God. But then here, just a few verses later, in verse 1 of chapter 12, he says, Remember also your Creator. If you're paying attention, you'll see that there's something going on there that's a little beyond the surface. Is it simply a redundancy, or is it in fact something else? Some of you have heard of this idea, but within Judaism, they talked about the two powers. Sometimes they called it the two Yahwehs. And they believed that there was one Yahweh who was invisible in heaven, and one that was visible on the earth. And that's where we hear about the angel of the Lord and some of those kinds of ideas. Now, as foreign as that might sound to you in some cases with the Old Testament, we also see that same idea lived out in the New Testament, do we not? Most of us here, I hope at least, believe in a trinity. We believe in a single God who exists in three persons. We don't understand how that works, but we believe that it does work. In Judaism, they weren't saying that there were two Yahwehs or two gods, but somehow they didn't understand how it worked that there were those two that they saw, an invisible as well as a visible that they would see on earth. I like what Paul says in the New Testament. He says, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. Do you ever wonder how many times people in Solomon's era and throughout that whole time of what we call the Old Testament era, actually had face-to-face encounters, visible encounters with Jesus himself. I don't know about you, but I'm a little jealous, right? Wow, to see Jesus himself face-to-face visibly. But let's go back to this idea of remember. Remember. What does it mean to remember your creator? What is he getting at there? The Hebrew word that he uses means more than some kind of a mental thought or a mental note. My wife's got a birthday coming up this week. And just imagine for a moment that late in the day, she finally comes to me and asks, did you forget my birthday? Oh no, I I remembered it's right up here, right? Do you think that's the way my wife is expecting for me to remember her birthday? No. By remembering it, she's not looking for me to have a mental note about it up here. What is she expecting? At some level, she's expecting for me to do something about 
remembering her birthday, that I would get her a card, I might get her a gift, I might even say the words, happy birthday, honey, right? To indicate that indeed, I do remember her birthday. Solomon is not trying to say that we should remember our creator in some kind of mental ascent. He's trying to say that there should be some kind of action that we take as a result of that thinking and remembering about God. And he finished this out by saying something that's so incredibly true. Don't let the activities and the joys of life cause you to forget the one who gave you life. Truth be told, that may be the case for some of us here. No show of hands, but think about this for a moment. This past week, how much time did you spend remembering the one who made you? Now, I don't mean this mental note, the, oh, yeah, oh there's a God, right? I, I'm, I'm talking about that mental note that led you to take some kind of action, to pray, to study his word, to try to know more about him, to reach out in ministry, to try to help somebody else. How often did you remember your creator this week? Or is he a little bit like me forgetting to say anything or do anything on my wife's birthday? I mean, shame on us if that be the case, right? He goes on here to say, before the evil days come, and the years draw near of which you will say, I have no pleasure in them. Before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars are darkened and the clouds return after the rain. You know part of what he's trying to say? Get ready. Old age cometh. And it's going to bring harder, and he calls them evil days. Years that are harder, less pleasurable than youth. That's not to say that all of the years of older age people are bad, but undoubtedly they are harder, which to all those you over 40, you would say what? <laughs> Amen. And then he gives this understanding of what old age is going to look like, in case you don't know if you're still a young person. He says, in the day when the keepers of the house tremble and the strong men are bent. In other words, our arms and our hands, our legs, they've grown weak. Even in some cases, our back is stooped and bent over. We were driving in this morning and, and saw this, this old guy just kind of shuffling along, you know, bent over. At least he was out getting some exercise though, right? And then he says, and the grinders cease. Because they are few. What's he talking about there? I'm one of those people that actually wears a mouth guard, so I really understand, you know, this set of verses. And those who look through the windows are dimmed. What's that? As many of us, I have my contacts in today. Many of you have your glasses on. And the doors on the street are shut when the sound of the grinding is low. Now, what you have to do here is you have to go back to the idea that the grinders are what? Our teeth. And so as an example, anybody wearing dentures? If you just take those out right now, we can kind of get a sense of, of, of kind of what he's talking about. But when you have few grinders, when you have few teeth, your lips tend to sink back in on your face. And one rises up at the sound of a bird. What's he trying to say there? Us that are a little more advanced in years, we get up early, right? I was up at 4 a.m. yesterday, right? Because I couldn't sleep. And he says, all the daughters of song are brought low. Eh? <laughs> what was that? They're afraid also of what is high and the terrors are in the way. Older people, if we think about it, many of us, and this is true of myself, are more risk adverse. I had an opportunity to go snowboarding a couple of Fridays ago, and I got to tell you, I really wanted to go because I haven't been in a couple of years. But my knee was kind of bugging a little bit, and I had some other aches and pains, and I actually backed out. Because you know what? I was afraid that I'd go up there and I'd get what? More hurt. And I know how much longer it takes to recover. 
The almond tree blossoms. Anybody ever had an almond tree? Does anybody know what color the blossoms are? They're usually white. What's he talking about? He's talking about how our hair turns white. The grasshopper drags itself along. This is the one that bothers me the most, right? I mean, anybody seen that poor little grasshopper that somebody stepped on one of his legs, you know, just dragging itself along, right? God, please don't let me look like that. Amen, right? And desire fails. We lose an appetite for the things that before we were very interested in. It be that food or sexual pleasure, that sort of thing. Then he shifts, and it's important for us to catch this shift. He says, man is going to his eternal home, and the mourners go about the streets before the silver cord is snapped, or the golden bowl is broken, or the pitcher is shattered at the fountain, or the wheel broken at the cistern, and the dust returns to the earth as it was, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. Vanity of vanities, he concludes, all is vanity. He's using metaphors for death, and we have them in our culture too. And he does one right after the other. What are some of the ones that we have, speaking of death? Kick the bucket. Kick the bucket. Yeah, that's, a, that's, that's similar to what he's saying here. What else do we do? Bought the farm. Yeah, that's another one. What, what was that? Go ahead. Pushing up daisies, right? Yeah, that was actually one I found this week. I hadn't heard that in a long time. What else? What is it? They're six feet under. But we have all of these different things that say people's passed on or they've gone to be with the Lord is sometimes what we say within the church. But notice one of his refers to this idea of the dust returning to the dust. Because we see that in Genesis 3 where God tells the first people, he says, you were made from dust and to dust you will return. That, to be clear, wasn't God's original intent. This was after they chose to disobey him. As I've said here a few other times in this study, that for Solomon, not unlike I would say Hawking, death is an enigma. It was a mystery. One thing that Solomon gets that I don't think that Hawking got is that indeed there is a God, and that we need to be mindful of the fact that there is a God a God to whom we are accountable to, a God to whom we'll bring either favor in our life or disfavor. Solomon certainly got got that. As to whether Hawking did, I think that's very debatable. But one of the things we've got to do is we've got to cut Solomon a little bit of slack. And I've tried to say that here before. Because Solomon lived about 950 B.C. Remember what B.C. stands for? See, Solomon didn't have some of the revelation that we have. And could I be so bold to say that even the revelation that Stephen Hawking had? He closes out in verse 9. He says, besides being wise, the preacher also taught the people knowledge. Weighing and studying and arranging many proverbs with great care. The preacher sought to bring or find words of delight, and uprightly he wrote words of truth. The words of the wise are like goads, and like nails firmly fixed are the collected sayings. They are given by one shepherd. My son, beware of anything beyond these. Of making many books there is no end, and much study is a weariness of the flesh." If you're a person who reads a lot, you might catch a literary device that's happened right here. I'm calling it bracketing. There's probably a different term for it. But Solomon started the very beginning of this writing in the third person to introduce himself. And remember, he described himself as the teacher or the preacher. We see that he comes back to that same idea in the third person here at the very end. But he points out that he sought to use diligence in preparing to wisely teach. He weighed, he studied, he's arranged all of what he studied. Honestly, as I read that, to me it reminded me a lot of my regular week. 
All of the study, all the preparation, all the arranging, whether it's wisely taught or not, I'll leave that decision for you. I share with people, though, that do teaching or present sermons like that, that a sermon's a lot like the, an iceberg. You know, what you see above the line is very small in comparison to how much went in to producing what you see being taught. He said that he used Proverbs to teach the people knowledge. I've got to tell you as a teacher, one of the things that's really important for me is to know that all the time and all the energy that was given to that had impact in someone's life. I read a story this week about a minister that he was out in the back like sometimes I am saying goodbye to everybody and a man came up and shook his hand and said, thank you, reverend. He says, wow, that was invigorating. I feel so refreshed now. And the pastor says, wow, thank you so very much. He says, yeah, after I woke up, I felt like a new man. (laughs) Some of you identify with that more than you realize. But he says something here that I think is a little bit lost to us in some of our English translations. He says that he sought to find words of delight. This is important. The Hebrew word literally means words of joy. Solomon recognized that one of the things he could do is he could be entertaining. He could simply try to be funny, to find words that would be inspirational. Because we all want to hear inspirational words, right? You know, one of the reasons that Joel Olstein is an example, is very popular. He's very inspirational in the words that he shares when he speaks. But Solomon, it says in the original, took a different tack. He wasn't simply looking for words of delight. He was looking for what kind of words? Words of truth. And he recognized that words of truth have more value in the long term than simply words of delight. He describes them as goads and nails. Now, it looks like in some of your translations that he's talking about two different things, but it's actually a single thing. It was a long stick that on the end had a iron nail that was strapped and fixed to it. And what they used these goads for was to prod the animals to guide and direct them where they wanted to go. And that's his point. Words of truth will guide, they will prick. It's not something that we necessarily want to hear. People will tell me every once in a while, man, I was so convicted about what what was shared in the message today. That's a good thing. If you just go away with a warm, fuzzy feeling, as most of you already know, that's going to go away. But if something convicted you, if something pricked you and caused you to realize, wow, I need to be living life somehow differently and going in a different direction, that's a word of truth that brought you to that place. There's a veiled reference most people believe here to God. Solomon's father, David, described the Lord as his shepherd. Psalm 23, as most of us know. But Solomon here warns his readers, and he uses this intimate term, my son. And he makes a statement that there is no end to the writing of books. Do you know how many books were actually published in the United States alone just last year? You might have a wild idea. Yeah, it was about 800 million books just last year that were published by a publisher last year. Add all the other countries out there where you have writers, and his point's well taken, right? There's always going to be more books. There's always going to be people adding more stuff out to the shelves. I'm blown away sometimes when I go into bookstores thinking about how much time and energy was written for all of that stuff. But he's trying to get us a little closer and say, you know, there's a lot of ideas that people have out there. But the ideas that you want to be looking for are the ideas that are coming from the shepherd, the Lord. Verse 13, he says, The end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. Solomon's final conclusion, if you look at it, is that life is short, and in his idea, is generally meaningless. But even so, you need to be mindful that God is going to bring things to judgment. 
And with that thought in mind, you should fear God and keep His commandments. It's interesting, as I've done this study, does anybody know what the most common word people have told me about this study that I've heard? If you think about this study, what's, what's the most common word that you think of? A little louder. Wisdom? Truth? Vanity? Smoke? Mirrors? Depressing is the word that I've heard a lot. Hopefully they weren't talking about my teaching of the text, right? But the text itself was depressing. And part of the reason for that is with this final exception here at the end where he says, fear God and obey his commandments, overall the conclusion that Solomon arrives at is very similar to his hypothesis. That life is basically meaningless. It's like chasing the wind is where he ends. Another great man died recently, though. This is the guy that some of you were thinking about on the front end, Billy Graham. The difference with Billy Graham is that he understood life under a different sun. S-O-N, sun. See, that's how Billy Graham understood life. And he taught many others about it. And I would say that Billy Graham was a great man because more so than probably all the way back to the Apostle Paul, he was the most prolific evangelist that this world has ever known. It's estimated that he preached to 185 countries and approximately 200 plus million people. Who even knows the number of people who came to faith because of his willingness to go out there and talk about life under the sun, S-O-N. Some of you here may have been influenced by his ministry. Maybe even came to saving faith because of what he did. But notice the contrast with what he says as he was preparing for death. He, so, he says, someday you will read or hear that Billy Graham is dead. Don't you believe a word of it. I shall be more alive than I am now. I will just have changed my address. I have gone into the presence of God. Amen? Would you stand? couple of things before we pray. One of which is, my hope is you already know this truth, as I know many of you do. Many of you have already come to the conclusion that Jesus is Lord and Savior, and you live under that Son. But if you're someone here today who's not in that place, and maybe some piece of it still isn't making sense for you, or maybe today it finally did make sense for you, please, I beg of you, do not leave here today without talking to myself or someone here at the church and saying, you know what, I want to know more about living under the sun, S-O-N. I get it, living under the S-U-N. And it is chasing the wind. But it's not chasing the wind when you live under the S-O-N. Amen? Amen? Second of all, it's about time we need to start preparing our hearts as well as thinking about who we might invite as we get ready to enter into this holy time. Next Sunday will be Palm Sunday. We're going to go right from Palm Sunday into Good Friday, that Friday night at 7 o'clock, and right into, on April 1st, resurrection celebration. He's risen. He's not dead. Amen? Amen. We know that. We're going to gather, hopefully, to celebrate that. But we do need to think about who is it that God would have us encourage to come? Who is it that's kind of on the outside looking in that needs to know more about this? Amen? Would you join me before the Lord? Thanks Father, for listening in. If you have any questions about New Life Living, you can call us at area code 505-898-9788 or email us at info at nlnm.org. Until next time, our prayer and hope is you will experience the fullness of the new life Jesus has to offer you.